one of the most interesting aspects of the study of flying saucers beyond the realization that they are real and extraterrestrial is their philosophy. What manner of creatures build and fly them? What do they look like? How do they think? Are their ideas and ideals similar to ours? Could we understand them? All these and many other questions plague the serious investigator. In this presentation, we'll mainly examine Wilbert Smith's key role in the research and analysis of the flying saucer phenomenon. Smith seems to have significant things to tell us. He does not seem to be that well known. As a prominent member of the Canadian government, he had access to classified information. Smith held an unusual combination of views, which seemed to be at odds with his scientific background and other work. And we will come across other figures who either worked with Smith, gave him information, or were speaking out during the same time period. And you're going to come across other figures who either worked with Smith, gave him information, or were speaking out during the same time period, such as George Adamski, for example, in that sort of time frame. Although I don't think he ever met George Adamski. Um, we're also going to look at some of the other disclosure issues um, relating to UFO and ET stuff, um, such as McDonnell Douglas aircraft documents, which were leaked to us in 2005. And I did mention in this presentation uh, Travis Walton's case as well, because this is the first half is basically Wilbert Smith, uh, second half is more disclosure, and then I put the Wilbert Smith thing right at the end, which I made a little video of. Um, and I also put into this some of the Mexico footage from 2009 as well. Um, and Wilbert Smith checked the evidence. Uh, a bit about his life. Uh, he was born in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada in 1910. Graduated from the University of British Columbia in 1933 with a BSc in Electrical Engineering. He obtained a Master's uh, degree in 1934 also at University of British Columbia. Uh, and in 1934 or, and 35, he became chief engineer for the radio station CJOR in Vancouver. And in the years following that, at certain times, he acted as a consultant to the government. And in 1939, he joined the Federal Department of Transport because the communications for Canada came within the Department of Transport at that time. Um, he was engaged in the engineering of Canada's wartime radio monitoring service. So they set up all these, uh, you know, network of aerials and receivers to pick up the various communications which they wanted to monitor. Smith was involved in that. 1947, he was in charge of establishing a network of ionospheric measurement stations, several of which were in isolated parts of northern Canada. Uh, he eventually became superintendent of radio regulations engineering within the department of transport, again, at all in Canada. Um, his research was into radio wave propagation, which is how radio waves travel through the atmosphere and can be affected by you know, land, uh, atmospheric conditions and so forth. Um, and he came across such topics as aurorae, auroras, cosmic radiation, atmospheric radioactivity and geomagnetism. That's looking at the Earth's magnetic field because that's all related to radio wave phenomena. Uh, and that's where he got interested in the source of phenomenon because of you know, things like effects on radio, magnetic fields, those sorts of things. And he continued to work for the Department of Transport until his death in 1962. And he died of cancer of the lower bowel in, uh, that, in that year. And at the time of his death, he held 37 patents. So he was a clever guy. Uh, and when he was married to Merle... And they had three children, James, Dick and Norma Ray. Uh, and you'll hear James, I've got a little audio of James Smith, um, because he has spoken about what his father told him when he was 19 years old. Um, so Smith's interest in flying saucers started when he became curious after reading an article in a magazine in the late 1940s. And though he started out as a strong sceptic, he pursued this interest in his own time strongly and systematically. He was an engineer... You know, so he's used to breaking things down, problem solving, all that sort of stuff. 
um, he almost always referred to them as flying saucers and very rarely as UFOs because that was a term coined by Edward J. Ruppelt in 1952. And the point was that they were unidentified. So, you know, you couldn't say what they were. So that was, you know, you couldn't call it a flying saucer. Um, and I just put in some pictures there of some of Smith's contemporaries. Uh, Frank Edwards, he was a sort of... Uh, a little bit like the George Nury of his day, you know, the sort of coast-to-coast -coast host he used to do programs like that. But he was a journalist. Major Donald G G Kehoe, who was in the Air Force, in the U.S. Air Force. And Kenneth Arnold, um, who was the guy who had the sighting of the object. Uh, but Betty and Barney Hill, was the, he knew of them. He got to know of them. They, well, they were abducted in 1961. So the, the reason why Smith became well-known in the UFO community was because of this document, the Top Secret Memo. Um, it was written in November 1950 by Smith, uh, and it was researched. Nick Blaskus discovered a copy of this memo in the University of Ottawa Archives, of all places. And it was declassified by the Canadian government in 1979. Uh, and this is a copy, I think it was a three or four page memo. And he said, um, I made discreet inquiries, this is about the flying saucer phenomenon, this is 1950 remember, so we're now 65 years ago, uh, through the Canadian embassy staff in Washington who were able to obtain for me the following information. The matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher even than the H-bomb. Flying sources exist. Their modus operandi is unknown, but concentrated effort is being made by a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. The entire matter is considered by the United States authorities to be of tremendous significance. OK, and then further to that, I was further informed that the United States authorities are investigating along quite a number of lines which might possibly be related to the sources such as mental phenomena. Mental phenomena. And I gather that they are not doing too well since they indicated that if Canada is doing anything at all in geomagnetics, they would welcome a discussion with suitably accredited Canadians. So they were looking for help at that time according to this memo. But mental phenomena. Smith was talking about the relationship between flying saucers and mental phenomena 65 years ago. The top secret memo, uh, people like Stan Friedman, they did a bit of research into this when they found out about it in the 70s or 80s. In fact, this was in 1983, so even this telephone call, which I've just edited together, because it's about 20 minutes long, the whole thing, if you listen to it, I've got the complete recording. And this all came from Grant Cameron. Um, the information about the classification of the UFO subject appears to have been given to Smith by Robert Sarbacher, and he confirmed this in a 1983 telephone interview with the UFO researcher and investigator, nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman. So I'll just play this clip, which is just about a minute long. Hello? Dr. Sarbacher? Yes? Hi, Stan Friedman. I've been in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. Oh, for heaven's sake. Let's see, early 50s. Now, the, the notes that I sent you from uh, Wilbert Smith, do you, do you remember? You do remember talking to him? Yeah, vaguely. The Canadian? Yeah, vaguely. Okay, that, his notes were uh, 1950, and let me see the exact date. September 15th were his notes, 1950. Uh, he asked you a question that you didn't answer at that time, which was rather fascinating. Maybe you've just given me the answer in a sense. So what Sarbacker was saying was that he did give the information to Smith. He confirmed that he gave him the information about the classification rating. 
Uh, and then Stanton Friedman wondered if that was to do with some of the crashes, the UFO crashes, but Sarbach had said he didn't know about that, but he, he'd heard rumours of it. That's what he basically says in that conversation. But that whole thing is about 20 minutes long if you listen to the whole thing. But that's just to confirm that we do know where Smith got some of his information from for that memo. And some of it came from Sarbacher. Uh, and Santa Fr- and uh, Grant Cameron did a whole lot of research into Sarbacher and his background and where he got that information. But it wasn't wasn't clear who gave Smith the information about the mental phenomena. Sarbacher didn't even give him that information. And that little bit where he's saying, you know, it's the, the operation of the sources is related to mental phenomena. That that bit of information came from somebody else. I don't think they found out who gave him that information. But it wasn't Sarbacher. But Smith left the memo draft in his files to give future researchers the truth of what had actually happened in the early days of government investigation into flying saucers. And dying of cancer, Smith made arrangement with his wife to hide the files so that they would survive his death. Uh, And Smith said they will be coming to recover them, he told his wife. As predicted, Canadians, Americans and the Soviets approached Mrs Smith requesting the files for research purposes. Mrs. Smith told all callers she no longer had the files, and after a number of break-ins that might have been linked to the search for the files, the files were passed on to Arthur Bray, an Ottawa researcher who held them quietly for over 20 years, till the mid-70s, and that's when Grant got on the case, and Nick Velasquez, they were taking up the case then. And I think Grant Cameron, uh, who still lives in Winnipeg, he's got most of those files now, and he's got a proportion of them. Uh, Because Arthur Bray, I think, has since passed on. So Project Magnet, this is it. Again, you'll you'll hear Smith's name in connection with this. What was Project Magnet? Well, in that memo, uh, he recommends that the Canadian government, because remember he's writing this memo to the Canadian government, he writes to them and recommends that a project be set up within the framework of this section, in other words, Smith's section, to study this problem, i.e. the flying saucer problem, and that the work be carried on on a part-time basis until such time as sufficient tangible results can be seen to warrant more definitive action. Cost of the programme in its initial stages are expected to be less than a few hundred dollars, and can be carried out by our Radio Standards Lab appropriation. So though officially Smith's flying saucer interest was private, in reality he used his knowledge and government position to instigate a research project known as Project Magnet, as shown in the memo, to study aspects of the source of phenomenon. That's, that was his goal. So he knew he had some resources at his disposal, and he thought, right, I'm going to use these because this needs to be looked at properly. That's what he did. Smith was therefore proposing to set up a semi-official study of the source of phenomenon. The proposal was accepted, and a station was set up at Shirley Bay, about 20 miles outside Ottawa. This was the Department of Transport's communications monitoring facility and the area was later used by the Department of Defence. So it was one of these, you know, sort of government areas. And here's some pictures that Grant had got. Uh, Obviously, the one on the left is more modern. Uh, I don't know what that is on the left, but this was some of the equipment they'd set up there. And basically, they were waiting for a flying saucer to be in the area. And then they were having, uh, you know, paper chart recorders to measure the strength of the magnetic field and so forth and various other um, readings that they were taking. Um, The project ran for three or four years with the aim of gathering information about magnetic phenomena. It was meant to be classified in case the results yielded a new insight into magnetic phenomena which might be exploited. It was not actually called a source of detection station and its existence was only reluctantly acknowledged during Smith's later life. So they didn't really like saying that they were sponsoring this sort of thing, as you'll see in a couple of minutes. Um, on August the 8th, 1954, at 3.01pm, after eight months of watching flat lines on graph paper, the gravimeter, which was measured, measured the force of gravity, uh, small variations in that, began to twitch and then it went crazy. Unfortunately, the area was completely fog- fogged in. Uh, so in other words, they detected something at that, at that time and date. Um, and the observatory and Project Magnet were both shut down on August the 10th, 1954, in other words, only two days later. After Smith's death in 1962, the strength of denials about the project seemed to increase. I've just got a little audio clip here of Smith talking about it. I might point out that uh, the 
project magnet that I was associated with, and which received a great deal of publicity, was not an official government project. It was a project that I talked the deputy minister into letting me carry out, making use of the extensive field organization of the Department of Transport. No funds were spent on it, and we merely had access to the very large field organization and opened a number of files. Unfortunately, the gentleman of the press climbed on this and made a big deal out of it. As a matter of fact, some of the headlines concerning Project Magnet were set in larger type than the Declaration of War. However, we carried the project through officially for about four years, and uh, the last year of the four, we had a little shed set up in which we had a number of instruments, the idea being to try and coordinate sightings with scientific measurements. We had equipment for detecting uh, any radio noise that might emanate from these objects, and uh, gravitational disturbances which might result, any radioactivity which might be connected with it, and any magnetic disturbances. These four instruments were of a recording type and uh, produced graphical lines on a recording tape using a four-pin recorder. This ran 24 hours a day with alarm circuits attached so that in case any of the pins uh, moved beyond a prescribed limit, the horns would blow and the bells would ring and the boys in the nearby ionosphere station were supposed to come running to see if they could see anything. So he didn't talk about the actual event that closed it down in that audio. This, that might have actually been... No, that was probably recorded after this all happened. But, uh, you know, he was then caught up in this kind of controversy over it. Um, but there was... Uh, we spoke about this on Facebook a little bit, because um, I need to find out a bit more about that. There was this Project Magnet Interim Report, which was classified in 1953, and it wasn't declassified until 1979. And the conclusions of that interim, this is the interim report, were as follows. The final report was never released to the public. Based on strict statistical analysis, Smith's team determined that there was a 91% probability that the objects were real and a 60% probability that they are alien vehicles. Again, I'm not sure how they determined that, but that's what was apparently in this interim report. That interim report sat on the Prime Minister's desk for three months. At the end of the period, Prime Minister Louis St. Laurent determined that the time for the release of such a report was not right, and Wilbert Smith apparently went along with the decision. In 1959, Smith wrote to a man who was attempting to get a copy of the Project Magnet, the fi Magnet final report, not the interim report. Smith wrote, You will recall last March that I didn't think you had a proverbial snowball's chance of prying it loose. No minister in his right mind is going to release any report which in any way might prove embarrassing or give rise to questions that he or his colleagues might find difficult to answer. So in other words, it's not the sort of information they can deal with in a political framework. You know, how do you politicise the UFO issue? Well, the answer is you don't. It's just not what politicians are into. A statement prepared for the Minister of Transport to be presented to, to, in the House of Commons, this is in Canada, of course, which has the same sort of system as we do, in the 1950s, for example, said the entire programme, as in Project Magnet, is being carried on with the official approval and authority to make use of existing facilities, which is what Smith himself said. Months after Smith died in late 62, Mr Dupuy, the Minister of the Department of Transport, made his final positive statement in the House of Commons. Between December 1950 and August 1954, a small programme of investigation in the field of geomagnetics was carried out by the then Communications Division of Department of Transport with a view to obtaining, if possible, some physical information or facts which might help to explain the phenomena which was generally referred to as unidentified flying objects. Mr W. B. Smith was the engineer in charge of this programme. So they said... It was run in the field of human by the then Communications Division of the Department of Transport. That was an official statement in 1962. By 1964, 
UFO researcher Arthur Bray received a letter that started the denial. At no time has this department carried out research into the field of unidentified flying objects. The department did not take part in any of that's bracket, Smith's research work, nor did Mr Smith provide the department with any useful information arising out of his work. By 1968, the denial was completed. The statement that would forever be provided for inquiries related to Smith was completed. The key UFO sceptic at the Dominion Observatory, Dr Peter Millman, wrote it up. Stanton Friedman knows more about this Peter Millman guy. I think he's spoken a bit more about the guy. The project was a personal one carried out by Mr Smith with the knowledge of his department without any official sponsorship. So they've actually changed the facts. You can see how the they subtly changed the truth over, over time. They denied any involvement. So we then come on to the story. Um, that's a sort of potted history of Project Magnet, which is what, again, Smith was quite well known for. Uh, the, the unusual story of Francis Swan, Affer and Tyler. Uh, now, Smith came into contact with Francis Swan because he was going around looking for people who'd seen UFOs and he was gathering witness reports and writing them all down and tabulating them and that sort of thing. That's what he was doing in the 1940s, late 40s and 50s. And Smith came into contact with Frances Swan in 1954. She was one of a number of ET contactees that Smith had corresponded with, again over the issues of sightings and contacts. This was due to Swan coming into contact with the US government regarding two mysterious satellites which orbited the Earth in 1953 and 1954 one of which reportedly came in and hovered over the Pentagon at 90,000 feet, according to reports then. So then, of course, Sputnik was the first satellite, and that went up in 1957, so this was before we should have had any satellites of our own in orbit. Swan claimed to be in contact with one of the occupants of the ship, Affa, who was commander of a ship called M4M4, and Ponar was the commander of L11, and she described them as 190 miles across, so... Wow, if they were that big, I mean, that's that's obviously huge. But some of this, again, is channeled information, which, you know, if you've looked at this stuff yourselves, you'll know is not, not necessarily that reliable. And it was Vice Admiral Knowles who knew Smith. Uh, he lived quite close to Swan, and he asked her technical questions, I think, in relation to these satellites, which she was able to answer. Uh, this convinced Knowles that she had some genuine knowledge. In other words, certain things Swan said, because she was just a, you know, an old lady. She wasn't involved with the military or anything. But Swan, they did have uh, an FBI file on Swan. Uh, and I think here... Yeah, and I, the, uh, when I got the archives from Grant, there's pages and pages of stuff that I think Swan had written out. I don't know who typed it, whether she did or somebody else. Um, Swan stated that on many occasions she was in contact with Affa, this, this commander of this ship. And these contacts went on for several years. She tried to arrange a meeting between Smith, Affa, government officials and an agreed location. Uh, and the documents about this were originally classified for a number of years. And Grant's got this story on his website, Grant Cameron, where they, they go and see uh, Francis Swan. I think there's Admiral Knowles and there's a couple of other guys. And she's apparently talking to Affa, you know, via telepathy or whatever. And uh, she, they say, well, we want proof, you know, that this guy is real. We want proof this is a real being that you're speaking to. So how are you going to prove it to us? And uh, so the story goes, uh, one of the stories, and there's, I think, more than one. She's, Francis Swan says, well, if you go to the window now, you'll see Affa's craft is out there. And they went to the window and they saw, you know, a UFO right at that time and they were amazed so the story goes i mean i haven't got any pictures or anything um but francis swan did live quite near betty and barney hill that she only lived about a mile away which is is quite unusual like elliot maine in the u.s um because that was in the u.s rather than in canada that that france francis swan in other words i think lived in the u.s not in canada but smith uh, got to know her through there Major Donald E. Kehoe, U.S. Marine Corps retired, a veteran of 35 years of civilian and military flying experience. Major Kehoe was aide to Colonel Charles Lindbergh on Lindy's tour of the country after the historic transatlantic flight. A well-known aviation writer, in 1950, Major Kehoe brought out his bestseller, Flying Saucers Are Real, which stirred up a real tempest. And in 1953, another bestseller, 
flying saucers from outer space. Books based on material from Air Force and Canadian official sources. Major Kehoe, what are the most recent developments in this field of unidentified flying objects? There are three very important developments which have been kept from the public. In the first place, there is at least one, and possibly two, artificial satellites circling the Earth at the present time. An intensive effort is being made by government scientists at White Sands, New Mexico, to locate and chart the courses of these satellites in an effort to determine what they are and where they came from. Secondly, within the last two weeks, Canadian government scientists have notified all official skywalkers to be especially alert and to report immediately any unidentified aerial object. The third development, which has been kept secret, is this. In the closing week of March, Air Force Secretary Talbot made two trips to Palm Springs, California, in an Air Force plane. On one of those trips, shortly after the plane had passed Fresno, California, the crew of Secretary Talbot's plane discovered that it was being followed by a large, silvery, disc-shaped object, which was flying about 1,000 feet below the Secretary's plane and about 1,000 feet distant. The unidentified object was seen by Secretary Talbot, the crew of his plane, and Secretary Talbot's aides who accompanied him on the trip. After watching the disc for several minutes, Secretary Talbot ordered his plane to swing around and approach it. The object immediately accelerated and disappeared at high speed. This was a daylight sighting of long duration by credible personnel and under very favorable conditions. In view of the tremendous amount of evidence that is being concealed by Air Force secrecy, it is high time the American people demanded to know the facts. Thank you very much, Major Donald E. Kehoe, U.S. Marine Corps, retired. And I mean, Kehoe, he was a key figure in the 50s and, and I think probably the early 60s. I think he died in the 1970s sometime, I think. But there's various YouTube interviews you can watch with Kehoe, you know, and he's quite a, an interesting guy to listen to. So, you know, he's he's well embedded into the UFO history. I mean, what happened with Smith is he was, what he seemed, the way it seemed to work is he was being given information by Affert and Tyler through, initially through Francis Swan. But I think then somehow Smith was getting the information directly. Somehow, I'm not sure how, but Grant told me, Grant Cameron, he said in one of his talks um, that it was really weird because he he got to know Smith's wife, Grant Cameron did. I don't know if she's still alive. I think she's probably dead now. I know his son's still alive. Well, his son was still alive a few years ago. I think Wilbert Smith's son's in his 60s now. Um and Grant said when he was spending time with Smith's wife, you know, they were driving along in the car with him and, you know, other people, and uh, it was like Affa was a member of the family. You know, Affa says this, Affa says that, you know. So it was really weird. He said that it was really strange how they were talking about Affa as if he was a member of the family. But apparently Affa was also in contact with a blind telex operator in Ottawa. And in 1959, during one of, one of Smith's gravity control experiments in his lab, where they were rotating a copper plate at 15,000 to 18,000 revolutions per minute, which Smith has written about elsewhere in some of the material Grant's got. The phone rang in Smith's lab, and the telex operator reported that he'd had a message from AFA saying that the experiment needed shielding, as in this rotating disc that was going around, so they didn't have it shielded. So they built a brick wall around the experiment, and then when they spun it up again for the next run, the thing blew up. So it's like AFA knew... That what was going to happen, and again, that's you know one of these stories. But uh, this is in the Smith archives. Smith also stated that he had a contact through an anonymous intermediary with another man from outside called Tyler, who described himself as a garbage collector, uh, and he describes one of the contacts from Tyler. But he has had contact with one of these people from outside now for a period of four years that I know of, and I believe that this contact has preceded that by several years. Uh, this contact uh, name, uh, the, uh, the man here on earth, I, I cannot quote, but the man from outside, his name is Tyler, and he calls himself a garbage collector. His uh, big job, he says, is to go around after we have misbehaved and clean up the mess. By misbehaving, I mean setting off nuclear explosions. Now, 
he gathers up this material, does something to it on board the craft, what we don't know, but it renders it reasonably inert. And then once a year, or thereabouts, it takes about a year to process this material, he dumps it in some rather secluded spot. In, uh, I think it was 1947, November issue or December issue of Time magazine had a picture of Tyler's craft dumping this material out over the American desert. A year later, Tyler sent a message to my friend that he was going to dump some again, that he would this time take uh, an opportune time when there, when many people could see the, to witness the process and that he would dump it somewhere near Ottawa. So, shortly after the armistice celebrations down at uh, Confusion Square in Ottawa, uh, everyone was buzzing around town. It was a very pleasant day. We looked up to the northwest of Ottawa, and there was Tyler's little craft, the lake-shaped affair, up in the sky, and coming out of the tail end of this was what looked like a almost dissipated... Uh, a portion of a jet trail, and this was dropping down. It was a white, smoky looking affair that was dropping down from the rear of this little craft, which was set at about an angle of 30 to 45 degrees. Well, we watched this through binoculars. In fact, having been warned, we had these things handy. We stood out in the yard, and I think about half of Ottawa was out watching it, too. And uh, the dump took about 20 minutes. We stood there and watched it, and this um, uh, tail of uh, dust kept getting lower and lower, and finally, when we looked up again, Tyler's craft was gone. We didn't see him go. Maybe he just took off in a hurry when he figured the job was done. Anyway, we watched this dust until it uh, had dissipated almost to the point where we couldn't really see it anymore, but by that time, it was down pretty close to the horizon. Now, knowing the size of Tyler's craft, which is roughly a thousand feet long, we calculated uh, from the field of the binoculars, other data, that he was about 50 miles away uh, from Ottawa and about somewhere around 15, 20 miles high, and just to the northwest of the city of Ottawa. Looking on the map, the, that region is completely and entirely uninhabited. So there you go, he said they saw Tyler's craft doing this end of the cleanup operation. So, you know, and this is Wilbert Smith. So, you know, make of it what you will, so to speak. Um, but I take him very seriously because of his credentials and his background. But the really, again, one of the really interesting things about this case, and I think unique, actually, or, or yeah, I'd say probably unique, certainly with the people involved, he, they were given information. He was given information, um, and he condi conducted some experiments which he showed it was possible to extract energy from the Earth's magnetic field. He thought this is what sources use for both propulsion and as an energy source. So he felt that they were somehow extracting energy from the Earth's magnetic field. So he described this device as a magnetic sink, uh, which energy would flow into. So it's where you capture magnetic energy. Now, I showed this circuit somewhere at a talk. This was oh, a good few years ago. And a chap in the audience says, oh, yeah, I, could, I, I, cannot, I, cannot, I can't understand that circuit. Uh, maybe one or two of the symbols, I know what they are. But he said, yeah, I can understand that circuit. I know, I know what it's for. So, you know, it is a valid circuit, uh, as far as I, I've been told. Um, so he was collecting, using that to collect energy from the Earth's magnetic field. Not a lot, probably only you know, a few milliwatts, probably of that. But that, that apparently is what it did. Um, but yeah, let's hear another clip of Smith talking about what he called the boy's topside. In other words, Affer and Tyler and people like him. As far as I know, our group in Ottawa are the only group that has actually taken the information which was given to us by the boy's topside and translated it into hardware that works. Much information has been given to us through various channels, but people just talk about it. They don't do anything about it. I think that is deplorable. I think when they give us information, we, the least we can do is to show our good faith by trying at least to convert that information into hardware. We have built 
two items of hardware on their instructions that I'm rather proud of. So they built two items of hardware, and there was this one, which is the binding meter, which he built. They gave us the design of the instrument, which was fundamentally this. They said to select two materials, one stronger than the other. And they said to arrange so that these two materials pulled against each other in such a manner that the weaker material was very near its breaking point and the strong material was a long way from its breaking point. On that basis, we devised instruments and we built quite a number of them in the shop, sent them around to various people uh, that we knew did quite a bit of traveling. And we asked them if they would investigate the regions through which aircraft must have passed just prior to breaking up in midair. And we have, unfortunately, a large record of our airplane having done just this. One uh, of these uh, unexplained crashes occurred at a place called Isudan, which is about 20 miles south and w uh, west of Quebec City. And we investigated the region through which the DOAC aircraft must have passed just prior to the crash. And sure enough, big as life and twice as natural, we found a very large and very strong vortex. Our instruments showed it beyond a doubt. It was about a thousand feet in diameter and roughly circular with a rather sharp line of demarcation at the edge of it. So he built this binding meter which was measuring this force which is not acknowledged by physics which helps to stuff to actually stick together to stay you know in coherency or whatever or just to stay and he was arguing that some of these plane crashes and the there were a few were caused by the plane sort of falling apart or you know the structure of it being become, somehow becoming compromised because it was traveling through these regions of low binding and that's what this binding meter was meant to measure and he said he, he, he you know, he, he gave these to people and they were able to measure this going up and down. And it wasn't to do with temperature or pressure. It was something else. That's what he said. And then the other one was that he made was this, was this coil. So I'll just play again play this clip of him talking about the coil. One of those pieces of hardware is a coil. It has a ferrite core and a trick winding on it. To look at it, it looks uh, like a rather oddly wound inductor. When measured on a radio frequency bridge, however, it shows some very peculiar properties. There, uh, there are certain frequencies at which it is impossible to balance the RF bridge, and that is a direct contradiction to what any electrical engineer will tell you should happen with a a coil of wire wound on a ferrite core. Now, if we take this coil and we excite it with radio frequency energy at or near the, these critical frequencies, we find that energy goes into the coil and nothing comes out. It just disappears. As a matter of fact, we had one coil about an inch in diameter and eight inches long, and we poured a kilowatt into that coil for two hours from a kilowatt communications type transmitter. The coil was in a two inch uh, brass tube with uh, a plate welded on one end and a transmission line fitting on the other. We could find no radiation around the outside of that tube at all. In other words, the energy went in and none came out. The uh, information which we got from the boys topside was that we were actually making tensor energy which is a six-dimensional radio wave. And it is the type of energy that they use extensively for radio communication, transmission of power, and for pushing and pulling. In fact, is they use it for just about everything that we could think of. So he was saying he was given these instructions to make this coil. Then he did measurements on the coil using the standard procedures that he would use for other types of equipment which he was working on. And this produced completely different sets of readings, which he couldn't explain. And he said that 
the, the contacts that he was in touch with, the boys' top side, said that he was creating this type of energy. They, he called it tensor energy. I mean, it's not a fam an expression I'm familiar with, but that's, that's what he said. And then he was told about gravity control, and this is what he said. Able to go into the laboratory and conduct a series of experiments which proved beyond a doubt that this is true. Our laboratory experiments have allowed us to make about a 1% change in the weight of objects. We can make them about 1% heavier or 1% lighter. Now that is a long way from holding a spacecraft up because we have to go over 100% in order to do that. But the fact that we can do it, the fact that the principle which these people from outside gave us and guided us to finding out for ourselves, our ballot certainly indicates that, first, these people are what they say they are, second, that their technology is what they say it is, that it is superior to ours, that ours is inadequate in many respects. So, he was given information, he built stuff, it worked. You know, maybe not spectacularly in terms of he didn't build his own flying saucer or anything like that. I don't think that was his intention. But he could see that the effects that they told him would be there were real. And going back to the binding forces thing, the binding meter, I was doing a radio show a while ago and somebody phoned in and said, well, do you think these binding forces that he was talking about, is that what they were modifying in the destruction of the World Trade Center? Molecular dissociation, how about changing the binding forces within the molecules and the atoms? Within? So I think it could well be the same thing that Smith was investigating in the 50s with this binding meter, it's related to... No, not that I'm not, people aren't using them. I think the binding meter is fairly easy to build if you've got a machine shop, you could, you could try it. Um, it's not something I can build myself easily. Um, but maybe you, actually it's something I could get a friend of Richard's to try and do. I think other people have tried to build them, but I don't think they've published any results to my knowledge. And I haven't looked. And there may be some web pages about it now because I came across this for the first time over ten years ago. So it's quite possible that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's not that difficult. I mean, yeah. So maybe somebody has reproduced it. Um, but the other really interesting thing, of course, is the source of hardware. Because because of what Smith was doing and his expertise and his skills, which you've heard a little bit about, it was he became a contact for the U.S. government and he was sent stuff. Um, Smith corresponded with several people stating that he had handled a number of pieces of source of hardware from crashes or military encounters, and that he'd been involved in their analysis. Art Bridge, uh, who Grant Cameron interviewed, I've got that interview on a disc somewhere. Um, and the, the audio quality is not good, very good, but you can understand what he's saying. One of Smith's associates stated that they were involved in an analysis of a lot of hardware. They were sent a lot of stuff, a lot of pieces over, you know, five, ten years, whatever. Uh, and also, Jim Smith, which is Walt Smith's son, he handled one or more of these pieces, as he describes in this clip. Was when he came from the States when it was delivered to the house by uh, the oh, Yeah, so he came from the States. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's what I was looking for. On more than one occasion, there were these pieces that were sent to him? On several occasions, and they'd be of different sizes, and there was no regularity to it at all. Mm. So he'd, he'd send them away for analysis and uh, try to cut pieces off them and do what he could as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, some of those pieces you were saying, uh, some came in the mail, some came by military vehicle? Yes. Yeah. Um, so there was uh, a, a number of them that were arriving. Yeah. You, uh, you actually saw some of these pieces as well, Jim? Oh, yes. Okay. And I saw them when you unpacked the box and what's in there. How old would you have been then? Oh, uh, well, looking at 10 to 17 in the age group. Did you get an opportunity to handle any any of them? Uh, how would you know what was an unusual looking piece of metal at the age of I got to handle a few of them. Uh, one was a chunk about the size of a brick, semicircular in shape, uh, very smooth metal except where the jacket edges uh, where it had been disconnected from whatever it belonged to. It was uh, quite heavy. In terms of its size, he had uh, analysis done of that one. I remember seeing that particular analysis sheet come back, and there were a few things in there that they're not found on this planet that were unidentifiable. Oh, really? Uh, well, other than that, they were uh, high tensile steel and uh, whatever else goes into it. So, presumably.
presumably that paperwork was secret and he wouldn't have kept any copies of the analysis. Well, I don't know where it would have gone. Mm. So they didn't know where the analyses went. Another piece that they spent a lot of time investigating was this Ottawa piece. Uh, it suddenly appeared on the shore of St. Lawrence River in 1960, uh, three tonnes approximately, composed of high-strength manganese steel fabricated in layers from of, uh, 0.01 to 0.8 inches thick, according to Smith. It looked like the thing had been subject to impact as it fell on a hard surface with very high velocity. The flat, presumably the top of the surface, was embedded with myriads of particles tentatively identified as micrometeorites. Analysis showed that it contained known elements, but such as we do not normally use in steels, and it was held by the Ottawa Flying Saucer Club for a number of years, so I think there was a big, long discussion of that, but I don't think at the end of it it turned up anything particularly interesting. But that, you know, again, they were alleging that might possibly be a piece of a craft which had fallen to the earth somehow, but it was not, that was never proved. Um, but also Jim Smith talked about uh, the viewing of alien bodies or his father. Now, uh, Jim, you mentioned uh, that he was shown uh, bodies at one point or, or something. Yeah, like that. on one of the times, he was in the States a lot, partly due to his work as a superintendent of radio regulation. So he had to deal with frequency allegations and channels and, and radio and that sort of business. So he was frequently on committees in the States where they were working out joint uh, frequency allegations, for example. And on several occasions, he invited off to be shown things uh, along this line. That was pretty well under the Official Secrets Act, he told us. However, when he, just before he passed away in 62, he felt the yeah, act couldn't get him any more than that. So uh, I did ask him, and he said, yes, he saw the, the bodies. And he had several connections with the high-ranking military folks, if I remember correctly. Yes. One of them was Rear Admiral Knowles, I believe. Uh, yes, yeah, we were at the Knowles home on many occasions. Yeah. And he was with, was it the Office of Naval Intelligence? Yes. Right, so there was opportunity there for this type of thing to be legitimate. He wasn't just, you know, mm -hmm. he was told these things were there and he saw them. Yeah. It would have been interesting to be a fly on the wall at those social gatherings, wouldn't it? Unbelievable, well, yeah. Did he describe them at all? Do you recall any Not that I can recall, except that the descriptions that had sort of been out and about were fairly accurate. The descriptions that were out and about were fairly accurate. Do we have descriptions of greys at that time? I think there were descriptions of smallish types. Uh, I don't know about necessarily the coloring, but no, I, I don't remember a lot of those details. Mm -hmm. I just read them. It satisfied my curiosity that he had seen them and that, and that they were real. So, Wilbur Smith said to his son that he saw the alien bodies wherever. I don't know if Jim Smith knows where Wilbert Smith saw them, but he did see them, and he said that when he was dying. So, again, is he, is he going to make that up? Did he have any with Area 51? Well, I don't know if Area 51 even existed in the 50s. Um, the, I think a lot of the stuff went on at uh, Wright-Patterson. That's allegedly where the Roswell bodies were taken to Wright-Patterson or Wright Field, I think, as it was called then, and the several witnesses that have identified that as being the place. So it may have been that Smith went to Wright Field and did some work there, you know, um, and he was using some of his radio work as a cover for that. But, uh, you know, Smith, I mean, he, he essentially got to the point where, that some of us, including me, have probably got to. Um, Smith felt that there was little point in trying to establish the rea reality of UFOs, do they exist? And this debate still goes on today, you know, do UFOs exist is the question that you'd see in the, you know. <laughs> of course they exist. You know, it's a question of what are they? That's the thing. So the question they pose is wrong anyway. But Smith felt there was little point in trying to establish the reality of the phenomenon. Uh, and he said that replowing and, uh, you know, plowing and replowing the same field, he, he, he got bored of doing the investigations. He knew that they were real. He wanted to find out what it always meant, you know. He wasn't really interested. I mean, the group that I go to, they just talk about sightings and stuff like that you know they don't don't really go much beyond that he wanted but smith did want to go beyond that he wanted to find out more about what was actually going on what it meant and in the last few years of his life smith turned his attention to the task of trying to rewrite the whole idea of scientific thinking from the ground up based on what he had learned from his experience and his experiments and from the boy's top side and if you read his book the new science which is incomplete but you can get a copy of it on the web i've read it um, 
He states at the beginning of this work, assembled by W.B. Smith from data obtained from beings more advanced than we are. He actually says that in the beginning. The work is available on the internet and deals with more in metaphysics initially rather than science, describing concepts of nothingness, awareness, reality, space. He looks at those concepts and breaks it down in those terms. Uh, and he talks about fields a lot. And Smith was unable to finish the book. He died before he properly finished it. Um, but the, 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 what's there is quite interesting if you read it. It's very interesting. So, again, I've just given you a thumbnail sketch of the story of Smith. Uh, Grant Cameron's got a load more information. Grant, I've got a two-hour talk by Grant, uh, which covers a, a bit more than this, uh, than I've covered. But he was looking at sightings, he investigated sightings, he talked about alien contact, he talked about viewing the alien bodies, he talked about energy technology, uh, he talked about anti-gravity technology... And he handled pieces of sources and did some analysis. And he also talked about official reticence. That was his name for cover-up. He called it official reticence. That was his name for it. He also had a realisation that metaphysics is important in understanding the phenomena, uh, which few people today speak of. They don't really talk about that. It's a bit more now, perhaps, but not in the way that Smith did. He, he did it in a different, slightly different way. But that, he did all of that between uh, 19, about 19, late 1940. He did that in 12 years. And he was saying all this stuff. I mean, he died in 60, 62, for heaven's sake. So this is 53 years since he died. So he was way ahead. He was way out there, way out in front, you know. And he's even ahead of where some people are now, you know, and what they talk about. So um, what I went on to next was just further disclosures and stuff related to the sorts of things that Smith said. And then I finished off with the Smith. Right at the end, I'll go back to Smith. Douglas Aircraft. Now, this was uh, also known as BIT-BR, BIT -BR, which is an abbreviation for boys in the back room. Boys in the back room. That was what they called it. Um, McDonnell Douglas and UFOs. McDonnell Douglas is an aircraft company, uh, originally called Douglas Aircraft. Then it merged with McDonnell. Uh, to become McDonnell Douglas, which then was taken over eventually by Boeing, so it's what is now Boeing. These documents pertain to the research of a small team of people in McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Corporation in 1967 to 1969. This is just to show, to show some people that they, they, you know, there was official interest in corporations in the UFO phenomenon. They did a serious investigation, and these documents prove it. They show that some people there took the UFO phenomenon seriously and they regarded them as real physical objects worth studying in detail with a view to developing a new method of propulsion based on a new theory of physics. So that was their motivation. They were in it for selfish reasons. They weren't in it for, oh, what does, what's all, what does it all mean? They wanted to get technology out of it that they could use in their business. That's what McDonnell Douglas were interested in. But they, they kept it sort of secret, they kept it confidential. In total, there are about 200 pages of documents, I think about 225 pages I've got, but some of those are just cover sheets. Um, and I've got a few of these here. The documents are left in a barn, which may have been belonged to a Douglas employee who died or moved, we don't know. But the new owner of the place found the files, and then he sold them on eBay for $31. And in March 2005, someone made contact with Grant Cameron, and he made contact with me, um, and we uploaded the documents to my website because I had enough web space to put, host these 200 pages. And they, you know, it took a few megabytes at the time. So they were uploaded to my PC via FTP by a guy called Louis. I forget his second name, but his first name was Louis. And um, gathering information from contactees is described in these documents. Uh, and that was a second main avenue of deriving useful data on the UFO propulsion. And the documents were written between March 1967 and December 1969. And they were written by J.M. Brown, Bob Wood. Uh, anyone heard of Bob Wood? Uh, I'll mention him again in a minute. W.P. Wilson and D.B. Harmon. Now, if you go onto YouTube, you can find presentations by J.M. Brown. I found one or two by him. Because he came up with a, a whole theory of physics called the kinetic particle theory, which he, he developed in some of these documents. Now, Bob Wood... Um, I found out later after we published these documents that he wasn't he wasn't totally happy about uh, us publishing them because uh, he'd worked on them and it was kind of secret. But it was in the 60s, but he wasn't especially happy. I didn't know that before I published them, but 
thought, hey. But interestingly, his son, Ryan Wood, has just sent me his book. But their rationale for the use of contactee data uh, is best derived from the so-called advanced vehicle concepts research presentation, which was like sort of like a PowerPoint presentation. If you look at it, you, I've got this whole document. It's about 50 pages long, but it's just like slides. You know, it's done like over, it's done, done with an overhead projector, I would think. Philosophy that they had was hear everything and use some of it to our advantage, which goes back to the commercial advantage. Contactee data could be useful experiencing high accelerations without forces, visual inter internal appearance of vehicles. That's the information they were looking at. What things were inside, what people reported. As seen. Uh, I sent electronic copies of these documents to Nick Cook, a defence journalist uh, at James Defence Weekly, who I've talked about before. And they were featured in UFOs, The Secret Evidence, a documentary which was broadcast on Channel 4 in 13th of October 2005. Where they actually showed a clip of about five, they had about five minutes on these documents which I sent him. But what really fascinates me as a defence journalist is that you are as likely to find believers in UFOs among the higher reaches of the aerospace industry as you are in Hollywood. This is a report into future technology commissioned in 1968 by McDonnell Douglas, then one of the biggest aerospace and defense contractors in the world. What's extraordinary about this document is that it takes the existence of UFOs seriously. It recommends using UFOs and copying their design to make the next quantum leap in aerospace technology. Some UFOs may be extraterrestrial vehicles. They certainly have not been proven otherwise. The existence of extraterrestrial vehicles indicates vehicles could be built which would have capabilities quite useful to McDonnell Douglas Corporation. The report even suggested interviewing contactees to gather data. And if they were thinking that over 25 years ago, what advances might be on the horizon today? So these are just a couple of pages from because there's like hundreds of pages, a lot of it's pretty dry, you know. But they described here like having an electron source and a sorter and then a strong magnet and then, uh, and doing stuff like that with electrons and electron guns and that sort of thing. And another experiment, I think, another describes the experiment to measure the effect of a magnetic field on a beam of light. So they wanted to see if they could deflect a beam of light using a strong magnetic field, but I don't think they got anything out of that. But these were the sorts of things they were looking at and seeing if they could get any information out of. That was their one of their goals. And then um, there was even some satirical cartoons, and you, I did, this is very unclear because it's like a photocopy of a photocopy or whatever, and it's also probably done from an, an overhead acetate. And if you see that there, it says, United States Air Force UFO Information Center on the door of the office. And um, the guys in the office are all tied up, to, tied to the chairs, and there's an alien answering the phone. And it says, the alien saying, I assure you, madam, if any such creatures as you describe really existed, we would be the first to know about it. <laughs> so that was actually in that presentation. <coughs> and J.M. Brown, he tried to develop this, I mentioned this a few minutes ago, a new theory to explain the behaviour of particles and the way in which the propulsion systems of UFOs may operate. And he called it the kinetical par kinetic particle theory. Um, and it was based around the idea of what he called a brutino, which was he said was this fundamental particle which was involved in all these forces. Um, and this is actually quite similar to because uh, if you if you've ever heard of Dr. Paul Violet, Dr. Paul Violet, he's done stuff on UFOs and he talks about this galactic super wa superwave. He he's he's come up with something called subquantum kinetics. He's written about subquantum kinetics. And he's written a sort of paper on that, which sounded quite similar to this kinetic particle theory, but they work totally independently. So, But I get sent these sorts of things every so often. People send me stuff about their... In fact, I've just got one from this Portuguese chap about the theory of gravity, the electric universe and the theory of gravity. Um, he's just sent me that. 
uh, yesterday, the final version of it apparently. But what was interesting is that uh, McDonnell Douglas, they even considered paying a contactee, whose name was Barbara J. Hickox, and they interviewed her and they said, we discussed the possibility of employing Mrs. Hickox as a consultant. We told her that if she accepted employment as a consultant, the company would expect to own any ideas divulged by her. So again, you're all back to this commercial aspect of it. She would in return see, receive the agreed upon hourly compensation. We agreed to proceed with the background information gathering to prepare a recommendation for, to our management that she be employed as a consultant at a rate of slightly over $3 an hour. If our checks on her resulted in our recommendation to management and if our, the management concurred, then a few exploratory hours of her time would be utilised. Further time might then be warranted to go into various areas in great depth, primarily in her description of the vehicle and its propulsion system. So they wanted to employ contactees in, in the 1960s.